In today's homework lesson, we will be moving on in our lesson about the acts and taxes, the road to the revolution. So get your notes out and go ahead and add on to what we left off in class so that you can continue this lesson in your history notebook. Our guiding questions today are, how did Great Britain impose political and economic control over the colonies? What steps did Great Britain take to increase control over its colonies? And why did many colonists become dissatisfied with Great Britain's control over the colonies? What do you think this is? Perhaps you thought chocolate or coffee? If you said tea, you were right. What you see here are tea bricks. You see, tea leaves were pressed tightly together and shaped into brick when they were shipped from Asia to the 13 colonies in Britain. Packed tea bricks took up less room in crates aboard ships for transport. The British East India Company was the only company that the colonists could buy tea from, and tea came from both India and China. When a colonist bought a tea brick, they would use it by shaving off a small portion of the brick to retrieve tea leaf filings that were placed in a strainer atop a teacup. When the hot water was poured into the teacup, the strainer would keep the loose tea leaf shavings from getting into the tea. The reason we are talking so much right now about tea is because this became a major product that England chose to tax the colonists for in order to pay back the war debt they owed from the French and Indian War. Parliament passed the Tea Act of 1773, which basically placed a tax on all tea that was imported into the colonies. Tea was a very popular drink in the colonies and Great Britain, and this tradition was part of their culture, everyday culture. But that did not matter. Colonists chose to refuse paying the tax by boycotting tea. They stopped buying tea and drinking it altogether out of protest to the British for taxing them without their consent. Their protests came to a head in Boston, Massachusetts, where a group of colonists who called themselves the Sons of Liberty chose to take action to send a message to the king and parliament that taxing them without their representation was wrong and would not be tolerated in the 13 colonies. Many of you already know what this event was called, the Boston Tea Party. So on the night of December 16th, 1773, the Sons of Liberty dressed up like local Indians to disguise themselves and boarded three ships that were anchored in Boston Harbor that were filled with cargo that had never been bought. The cargo was tea, tea that the colonists did not buy and did not want. These angry colonists threw the tea into the harbor during this event. Draw a picture of the Sons of Liberty on board a ship throwing off the cargo of tea near your notes. Today, you can actually go to Boston and visit a museum along the Boston Harbor dedicated to the Boston Tea Party event. They have replicas of the three British ships carrying the tea, and you can actually throw off boxes of tea into the water. The museum also has a unique primary source that washed up on the banks of Boston several years ago, an actual box now empty that had once been full of tea. This very box had been dumped into the Boston Harbor on the night of the infamous Tea Party. What do you notice about the location of Boston on this map? Do you see how the city is on the water, right up next to the Atlantic Ocean? This is important. How do you think many of the people in Boston made money? See all of those ships in the harbor around the city and notice the long dock that ju juts out into the water where ships are coming and going, unloading their ships with things that were imported from other places and loading them up again with things that would be exported. Boston made its money through trading through its ships coming and going. Without the harbor, where boats could load up and unload, the city would not be able to make money and be successful. Many people living here were business people who relied on shipping to trade. England knew this. So, when they found out about the Boston Tea Party and what the people of Boston had done to, the, to protest the taxes on tea, they were furious. The Parliament and the King thought of a punishment that would teach the people of Boston a lesson. In a direct response to the Boston Tea Party, England punished the city of Boston through a series of laws called the Intolerable Acts, also known as the Coercive Acts. To the people of the colonies, these acts were intolerable because they were awful and unbearable. 
to the people of England, they were called the Coercive Acts because their, their purpose was to coerce or force the people of Boston to submit to the authority and the control of Britain and behave themselves as loyal subjects to the crown. So what were the intolerable acts of 1774? Well, they were a series of laws that took away rights from the people of Boston to punish them for throwing all the tea into the Boston Harbor during the protest of the Boston Tea Party. First, the British closed the Boston Harbor and did not let any ships come or go for trading. The British brought in big warships to guard the entrance of the harbor to prevent the people of Boston from trading and making money. The second part of the Intolerable Acts was bringing more British soldiers to Boston and putting soldiers in colonists' homes for the purpose of making sure that all of the taxes were paid and that the people were obeying these new laws meant to control them and keep them in line. The third punishment of the Intolerable Acts was the disbanding of the Massachusetts legislature. That means that the, the British forced the local governments in Massachusetts, like Virginia's House of Burgesses, to shut down and close. This meant that the people of Massachusetts no longer had people in government making laws for them that they had voted for themselves. The ones who were now ruling were the British officers. Can you imagine how the colonists in Massachusetts, particularly Boston felt, losing all their rights like this all at once and not having a way to make money the way that they had used to? England did this on purpose. They feared that the other colonies like Virginia or Maryland or New York might start having Boston tea parties and protesting like the people of Boston had done too. They were showing the other colonies what would happen to them if they rebelled like Boston. The other 12 colonies did take notice of what was happening in Boston, but unlike what England had hoped, when colonists living on in other colonies heard the news about the punishments of Boston, this inspired them to take action too, band together and start talking about liberty, independence, and how to rise up against the tyrant of the British Empire. The phrase taxation without representation became a theme throughout the 13 colonies during this time. This means that the American colonists had no say in whether they were taxed or not. Britain was doing all of this taxing without their permission. And American colonists may have been willing to pay taxes to support Great Britain in the first place. I mean, she was the mother country that many of the colonists had come from. And the colonists simply wanted to have represent representatives in Parliament to provide input when they were making laws. But every single member of parliament lived in England, not the colonies, and represented the people living on the British islands, not the colonies. The colonists sent letters asking the king and parliament to consider this request for representation in parliament. But over and over again, the king and parliament refused to give the 13 colonies representatives in government. In fact, Parliament ignored the colonists' requests, and over time, the colonists felt insulted by this. You already know this from our Royal Family Part 2 lesson, but the British king at this time in history was King George III. He was a young king when the Boston Tea Party took place, and the colonists' behavior towards the taxation without representation greatly upset him. He wanted the colonists to behave like children obey their parents. King George III saw his country, England, as the parent of the 13 colonies. But this was not working out over in the colonies. As we know, the American colonists did not like the way that he was operating the British Empire. The colonists saw thought that the king treated them unfairly with taxing them without representation in Parliament and the Intolerable Acts. The colonists did not feel like their king cared about them, but instead thought of them as only a way to make money for himself and to pay the war debt that England had. If you have not yet drawn a picture of King George III in your notes, go ahead and do so now. There is a funny book on my bookshelf that has a 
crazy name. And you guessed it, it's called Can't You Make Them Behave, King George? And it plays off of the ideas that we've been talking about. Right. Was the colonists in would have been a everyday occurrence for the people living in Boston in the 1700s because more and more British soldiers were coming into the city to collect taxes, enforce the laws, and keep order in the colonial towns. Can you imagine how threatening this was for the colonists trying to live their lives in peace, but on every street corner, what did they see? This. British troops. In response to the protests, the king sent thousands of British soldiers to American cities, not just Boston. Soldiers came to enforce the laws, collect the taxes, and prevent uprisings. Soldiers actually stayed in the colonists' homes because the law forced them to. The colonists were not happy about this. They resented the idea that they needed redcoat babysitters to come over and watch over them. Draw some redcoat soldiers marching down the street next to your notes. In the end, it wasn't about the taxes. The real issue was that American colonists felt that they were being disrespected by the king and by parliament. The colonists believed that rights were being violated by the way they were being treated.